So we're going to get into uh, chapter 16 this morning of the book of John as we continue our study. And uh, as we begin, I'll, I'll, uh, while you're looking that up, I'll bring s- some humor for you this morning. <laughs> I know it's a shocker, <laughs> a surprise. Um, I found this story about these three boys, and they're, they're just out playing, and, and then they get into this the, one of those bragging matches about whose dad was better than another. And the first boy says, you know, well, my dad, he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, he calls it a poem, and they give him $50. The second boy says, oh, that's nothing. My dad, he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, he calls it a song, they give him $100. And the third boy, he says, I've got you both beat. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, he calls it a sermon. It takes a whole team of people to pick up all the money. <laughs> all right. So we're going to get into uh, chapter 13, as I mentioned, and um, we're going to go right into it. Uh, I, if you're reading along, please keep it open because we're going to kind of take the first couple of verses slow and then, um, uh, and then read some more. So we'll get going right away. John chapter 16, beginning in verse uh, 1. Um, it says, Jesus is speaking here, and he's talking to his disciples, and he says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogue, and indeed the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when, the, when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And let's stop right there for a moment. There's a couple of things going on I think that we, we will want to take note of. And hopefully it will be a really, uh, uh, just a strong encouragement to us this morning. Now first off, when he says in verse 1, that I've said these things to you that keep you from falling away. Now, this is a continuation of the discussion that we began to read last week in chapter 15. Jesus and the disciples have left the upper room, and uh, Jesus is teaching them here and talking to them, and he's preparing them for what's to come. And as we've said in weeks before, Jesus is now heading to the cross, and he's going to be taken from them, he's going to be crucified, and he knows that they're going to be lost, that they're going to be worried, that they are going to be wondering what's going on and what they should do, and even being afraid and fearing for their own lives at this point. And so here in verse 1, when Jesus says, I told you these things, what he's talking about is all that other stuff that we've been reading the last several weeks in preparing them about uh, that he's going to be taken away. Jesus talked to them about their mission and what he wants them to do and to continue to to not give up on the reason why he came of sharing the light of Jesus Christ with the world. And he talks to them about their need to love and support each other uh, because they're going to need each other. The work is difficult and it's hard and their journey can be long and it's challenging. And he says, so stay committed to one another, support each other, pray for each other, love each other. He said, even as I have loved you, Because it's going to get hard. You're going to need one another to get through. And then he warns them that the world will hate them and persecute them. And even as they kill Jesus, later they'll kill them them as well. Um, So he tells them all all these things, but then that he'll help them. And so here is this instruction then, these warnings, this this, uh, provision of of Jesus trying to prepare them so that when he goes to the cross, they might recognize and remember the things that he told them about. And he tells them, I want to tell you these things so that when they happen, you will not fall away. You will not give up. You will not quit the journey. But he, they might have faith to make it through. Do what is right, even when it gets hard, even when it requires sacrifice. I was uh, pondering on this, and I remember this story. There's this youth pastor that I knew that worked in uh, the inner city area of Los Angeles. So he did. A, he had kind of a street ministry to teens that were uh, many of which were even homeless and living in downtown Los Angeles. 
and they had arranged this trip to take them to the mountains and for the very first time in their life these these young kids these teenagers were going to see snow they're going to go play in the snow now we don't think that that's much a big deal because uh, especially this year we were kind of glad I think when the snow went away but for these teenagers this is the very first time they'd ever seen snow in their life and they're going to go up in the mountains and they're actually going to get to touch it and play in it for a while. And they are so excited. So they load up this bus full of these kids and they're heading up the mountain. Now, this, uh, I, I know how this works after living down there. I mean, down in L.A., it's 70, 80 degrees. And, and there's nothing. There's, there's no snow. There's no rain. You know, blue sky, sunshine, a beautiful day. And you start making your way up the mountain. And they got, they're heading up the mountain. And they, they get part of the way up. And they come around a corner. And they're kind of in, the, in, in a shadow. In this protected little area was their first patch of snow. And they saw it. And they got so excited. And they started, there's snow, there's snow. And they're yelling it through the whole bus. And, they, and of course, it's only on one side. The bus almost tips over as they all go to the one side. And they're leaning up against the windows to see. And so they, they said, calm down, sit down. Everybody sit down. So they keep going. And well, then they get around the next bend. And here's enough snow. There's like this whole patch of snow that's out there. And, and these kids just start, start going crazy. They start screaming. We got the snow. There's no stop the bus. Stop the bus. And they, they, um, they, they, were, they, they were just yelling. And they're all again, they're all on one side of the bus. And they're jumping up and down. Stop the bus. Stop the bus. And so just to calm them down, the bus driver just had no choice. He, he, uh, he pulls over on the side of the road. And the, the kids just go cramming towards the front of the bus to get out. Let us out. Let us out. Let us out. And so they open the doors. These kids go running out. And it doesn't take about 30 seconds. And after 40, 50 kids are, are just out in this little patch of snow. And of course, it just turns to mud. There was nothing, nothing left. What's interesting about that is that um, the, these kids, they're so excited to see that snow. They're so excited for what they, they saw and wanted in the moment that they, stopped, that they stopped the journey. They didn't realize 15 minutes down the road was going to be more snow than they could possibly imagine. There would be more snow than they could ever wear out. They, would, they could be there for hours sledding and snowball fighting and, and playing and doing all this stuff. They had no idea what was awaiting them. And they almost ended the journey um, because in, in a moment of, of thinking they saw or found what they finally wanted, they were ready to give up and just be, and settle for that. And sometimes we do that in our life when there's a glory that's waiting for us. There's a reward that Jesus offers to us. But in the moment of our desires, in the moment of maybe a hardship, in the moment of some part of the journey, we see a detour, an off-ramp even, that we want to take. And we fall away. Now Jesus is saying then to, he, to, to, to these disciples, he's, this warning, he's saying don't fall away. The journey's going to get hard. The, 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 the persecution's coming. And he even rewards them. You're going to lose your life over this thing. It's going to cost you everything. But even in that, it is worth it. Even in that, hang in there because 15 minutes down the road, and who doesn't know that, uh, can, can some of our seniors testify that, that, that life feels like about 15 minutes? <laughs> it's, oh, it goes so fast. And just a few miles down the road will be more glory than you could possibly imagine. And Jesus is saying, don't give up because of fear. Don't give up because of sacrifice. Don't give up because it seems like it's more than you're ready to give. Don't fall away. But you know what the problem is? I think the unfortunate truth, at least what I see, because we don't live in a, in a lot of persecution. 
Um, there's some happens. But unfortunately, I see people giving up on the faith for so much less. They, 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 they give up for, for just all the wrong reasons. In our culture of freedom and cheap grace, people fall away because the church got a new pastor and they just don't like him. People give up on their journey because their kids got into sports. People give up on the journey because summer arrived. We fall away for things that are so much less important. Don't give up. Don't fall away. I just... This week, as I was praying and thinking up through this, I just thought, oh, you know, just this heavy burden uh, of being so tired of of seeing people fall away for no reason at all. <laughs> Giving up on the journey. Giving up on Christ and following the Lord because of reasons that they just exited the bus because they had no idea what was waiting for them down around the next corner. Don't fall away. But hang in there. But then he gets into, and then in then verse 2, he says, they'll, they'll put you out of the synagogues and the hour's coming. He says, when they will kill you, those who kill you will think that they're offering service to God. That was an interesting phrase. That's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the, the Jewish leaders, as, as you know, they, they didn't understand, they didn't receive Jesus as the Messiah. Um, as he was bringing all this change, as he was making things, you know, kind of the, the seat of power and authority was shifting to, towards, him, towards him and to what he was doing. And, and he was, you know, rocking the boat on a lot of things. And we saw over and over and over these, these conflicts between uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the law, the law writers, the, the leaders of the time, and coming against Christ. And, and so um, they wanted to stop this movement of Christianity as God was bringing a new covenant. And, and so um, in believing they still were serving Christ, uh, still serving God, they put Christ on a cross. And in an effort to stop those who would follow Christ, even killing them, they still believe they're offering service to God. What the interesting observation here is it has happened all throughout history. Uh, uh, the Jews have done it. The Muslims are still doing it. And, and the Christians are still doing it. All kinds of people that do horrible things thinking they're doing it as unto service to God. And we see the many great atrocities have been done in God's name. People have done all kinds of either horrible things or just dumb things in God's name. It's one of the arguments against religion. A lot of people don't trust religion, don't like religion, think that it is the greatest affliction against mankind to have the faith that we have because religion is the problem. Many people see zealots doing horrible things in the name of God or be in the belief that they're serving God. And so there's this tremendous argument out there that it is religion that is responsible for some of the worst conflicts that have ever taken place in history. Um, and it would even seem as though that might be true. It is not, we don't have to look very far to see people doing horrible things in the name of service to their God. It's the reason people fly airplanes into buildings. It's the reason people strap bombs onto themselves and, and, and go blow up crowds of innocent people. It's the reason that People hold signs and stand out in front of gatherings and conferences and yell and scream and are angry uh, because they disagree with, um, with whatever might be happening there. Violence is done in the name of God all the time. 
but I think that what's really going on there is it's just the next excuse is to just the next reason. It's just that somebody had an idea that has grown and it, give peop- it gives people permission to do evil things. To do what's already in their heart. To do what's already in their, in their intentions to do. And I, and I, and I love what, um, there's, a, there's an author by the name of Ross Duthout. I don't know a lot about him. Um, I believe he's Catholic or at least had a Catholic background, but he wrote a book called Bad Religion. What I found interesting, he appeared on the Bill Maher show. And uh, if you know anything about Bill Maher, he's a pretty strong advocate against Christianity specifically, but really all religion. And he, as he's an atheist who, who strongly believes and uses his platform a lot to point out this very fact that religion is the problem in the world. Um, but anyways, as they were having this conversation, do thought, if I'm saying his name right, do thought said, well, it really depends upon your view of human nature. He says, if you believe that human nature is pretty much okay, pretty much good, and then along comes a religion, and that's what makes them kill each other, then you can see why religion would be bad. Of course, he's cut off there, but he's going on to say, he does go on to say eventually, that what's amazing is religion, when religion actually takes a bad person and helps them to be good. What is amazing? is when religion actually changes a person and helps them to rise above their situation, their circumstances, what they've been uh, taught or or, um, uh, experienced all their, what helps when when religion or faith in Jesus Christ, Christ helps a person actually rise above their pain, their anger, their, their, their bitterness to actually become good. And loving and kind. Those are the things that are amazing to watch when faith in God, belief in God, actually makes us a new creation and a new life because of Jesus Christ. When we're changed and we become better because of Him. And so for some, religion just becomes an excuse to do what they already wanted to do. It becomes an excuse to do horrible things and horrible atrocities. Because the Bible seems to indicate that our nature, by by the very nature of who we are, is sinful. But the followers of Jesus become something new. That's where the miracle is. That's where the power is. When we follow Jesus and he takes a hold of our life and the old begins to become anew, selfishness turns to sacrifice. Lust becomes love. Fear learns how to be faithful. Pain gives way to peace. Sinners receive salvation. Anger learns how to let go. Bitterness tries to forgive. That's where the power is. Ephesians 4.22 says, Put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through, um, through deceitful desires and to be renewed by the spirit of your minds and to put, off, put on the new self created after liken, likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, God is able to humble the proud. He replaces joy for sorrow. God can even give us victory over death. That's the power. That's what's amazing. That's the God that we serve. That's what he wants to do in your life and in all those who follow him. That's what Jesus is pointing to here. That's what he hopes to see happen because yes, there are those that are going to do evil things. Yes, there are those that in the name of God do horrible acts of of service, violence, and hatred. But the true power of God is when whatever you're, you're facing, whatever you're fighting, whatever you're struggling with in your life, God helps you find the strength to rise above it and become that new self. Well, how does this happen? Well, he goes on in verse 4. Let's take a look at that. 
in uh, this is the second half, begin the second half of verse four. He says, "I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you, but now I'm going to Him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going." But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And Jesus says, I will send the Helper to you. You know, we understand some of the things that he's saying here. Why... Um, um, uh, some of this is, is clear. It makes sense. Why, why Jesus would say that their hearts are going to be filled with sorrow. As followers of Christ. They're going to lose him. And they're not going to. Um, you know. Their, their heart is just going to be saddened. We understand that. Um, he, as, as they lose him. They're going to be afraid. Um, it is kind of interesting. When he said. I didn't tell you this at first. It's kind of their. Uh, it's kind of their. Why didn't I take the blue pill moment. Uh, if you're a sci-fi fan out there. But Jesus did not tell them all these difficult things from the beginning, but he's revealing them to, him, to them now because they're going to need to be prepared. And he's saying to them, but at the end of this, it is to your advantage that I go away. It's to your good. It's to your help. It's, it's, it's for your sake that I'm leaving. You know, we never think of life like that when someone we love and care about goes away. Um, it's, it's, it's hard for us to even be happy for them. I mean, we try. We're so, we, we, we try to find comfort in knowing that, that what's happened in their life, it's better for the other person when they die. We say things like, well, they're in a better place. We say things like, well, we, we know that they're not suffering anymore. We say things like, well, they were able to go and be with Jesus. Although some don't want me to pray that for you. or <laughs> go, and, go and be with Jesus. Um, I mean, we, we, we know what that means. We trust that. We find great strength in those truths. But that's not what Jesus said. He says, it, it's not for me that I leave, but it's for you that I leave. It's not that I'm going to be gone. It's that what's going to happen to you when I'm gone. And he wanted them to even find comfort in their faith when he left because it will be better for you if I leave. And so think of it. It is to your advantage that Jesus was arrested. It is to your advantage that Jesus was put in chains. It is to your advantage that Jesus was beaten and that Jesus was whipped. It is to your advantage that Jesus was crucified on that cross. Why? Well, first we understand this gift of his sacrifice purchased our salvation. It's through his death on the cross that we can ask for forgiveness. It, and his blood covers our sin and we're reconciled with God. But what he's talking about here is, is to our advantage that Jesus was um, laid in the tomb and later three days he arose that when he left, he said, I will send the helper to you. That's what the, the advantage he's talking about here. I want to share a little video with you not a perfect correlation here, but I just found it so amazing. And um, it's actually um, secret or hidden footage that was uh, that is filmed in house churches in China. And um, I'll, I'll, here I'll tell I'll tell a little secret this morning um, on the worship team because they were struggling in practice and they were a little nervous that maybe it wouldn't turn out really well. <laughs> When, when it finally got to uh, um, the service. And, but they had a great conversation about, well, you know, we just need to trust God through this. And, and we found that sometimes if we just step back, let God do what he does, it turns out just fine. Without Bibles, without churches, without instruments, um, without any conveniences that we just could not imagine having church without, they are watching the church explode in their midst. In homes, 
in secret and under persecution. They hide and have to gather together because um, if they were discovered, they would, they would certainly be persecuted if not killed. And so the, uh, this is some of the most rare footage on earth, they claim. Some of the most rare footage on earth sharing with you what's happening in China right now. That's just a portion of a, of a longer documentary. Um, maybe we'll show little pieces that, uh, as we go. Um, but it just goes on to just share some amazing stories of how, how faithful they are, um, how, how much they long to learn more and to experience God and to share their, their thankfulness and their gratitude. There's a, a, that, there is an example of a group of believers that knows exactly what it means to need the helper. To, to be able to gather under threat of persecution like that. But with a, such a desire for God, a desire to worship Him, a desire to pray, spending long hours every day seeking after Him. Uh, I, I just, I read that and, and, and I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed for the American church. I'm, I'm embarrassed for my own Christian walk. Um... As I think about what it means to walk in the Spirit, to rely upon the strength of the Spirit of God, to know that Jesus said that what needs to happen is I need to leave, so something more important even will happen, that the Helper would come. And the Helper would, would cause us to know all the things that Jesus taught. The Helper would come and that we would, we would be transformed into what God wants us to be. The Helper would come so that we could share what God's done in our life with others that need to know who He is. The Helper would come and give us the, the transformative power that changes us from what we used to be to what we're becoming now. Do you reach out your hand for the helper to do his work in your life? Do, do, do you seek the Lord to help you? Jesus said he's coming. He would send him and, and, and we saw the helper come. The Bible tells us that he's here. We just have to walk with the Spirit walk with the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us and help us in the areas that we need. Part of the reason we gather for prayer on Thursdays and again would just invite you to come if you can be with us. What are you doing in your own time with the Lord seeking that He would strengthen you and His Spirit would fill your heart, fill your life with His presence that He would make you into what God wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, we just...